Welcome to the Open Forum. Once again, together we can look into this precious word, the Bible. What a privilege, what a privilege. Oh, I know it's scary in these days when we're just a little bit more than a year from the very end. Uh, and yet how grateful we ought to be that we can know so much detail about the end of the world and an exact timeline and learn also this fantastic fact that right today God is saving many, many people. And anyone who is still not saved uh, is encouraged to cry out to God for mercy, uh, to turn from their sins, recognizing, and this is one of the first points that we have to face, is we got to recognize we are sinners. There are a lot of people who think they're pretty good. And uh, if we think we're pretty good, uh, then we don't really have to... Uh, 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 answer to God because after all we don't really have that much sin in our life and uh, we are deceiving ourselves because the Bible teaches that even if we commit one little sin it's like we have broken the whole law of God we need a savior and so when we any of us honestly look at our lives we can see many sins and and if we're not a child of God if we're not certain of that we truly are thankful that we can cry out today, Oh God, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. Is it possible that I too might become saved? But we have to wait upon the Lord because the whole work of salvation, and I can't say this strongly enough, the whole work of salvation is God's work. We make no contribution to it. And we don't want to think in that direction at all. Because that would mean, if we were thinking in that direction, that, well, after all, I did this or I did that, and that's the reason I became saved, then it, the Bible guarantees we are not a child of God. All the work was done by Christ. But this is your program. We want to hear from you. So shall we take our first call tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Campy, how are you? Very well, thank you. My question is that God is so perfect, obviously, and He created everybody in the world. Why in the world would He even have created Satan? And why would He give Satan any kind of rights to the, the, control it, His creation, it, mankind? Well, we have to get back to the the basis or the reason for this world, and that is... Uh, uh, suggested very strongly in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 where God is indicating that uh, the events the ch as he saves a, b a body of people uh, out of this sinful world is done because it is displaying the righteousness the glories of the Lord Jesus in other words God has developed a a program here, a, a whole uh, event here that brings into focus the glorious and wonderful attributes of Christ. And uh, if, ever, if there were no sin, if there were no Satan, then it would mean that everybody would be in, uh, in harmony with God's will and that would not demonstrate God's uh, forgiveness. It would not demonstrate his patience his, uh, and a lot of other attributes of God. But as we uh, see how the whole human, how the whole, uh, the whole histor history developed all the way from creation to our present day, and we see how Christ uh, it was interrelated into all of this again and again and again, and how often he forgave, and how often he was patient, and how often he, uh, and this and that. And as we see his goodness on unsaved men who are in rebellion against him, we read in Matthew 5 that he sends his, his rain and sunshine on the just and the unjust, uh, uh, so that even those who are not saved, if they, in, uh, they can also have, a, a very, very nice time here 
in the days that they live here on this earth. In fact, that's one of the reasons people don't want the end of end of the world to talk about how they don't want to talk about that and they don't want death because they are enjoying this world to a very high degree even though now, they I, don't have everything if god if god said jesus said that he loves his enemy or love thy enemy um why then does jesus love or does god love satan oh well now, now, does God love the enemies? Now, I just quoted from Matthew 5 that Christ sends his uh, sunshine and rain upon the just and the unjust. And the unjust can be vicious, rebellious sinners who are mocking God. And, and yet God, in his love and in his mercy, sends them good health and he sends them... Uh, our pleasant friends and uh, uh, food that tastes wonderful and, and so on and so on. That's a fact of God's love for mankind. And uh, uh, we, we don't ever have to question whether God uh, loves mankind. No, it is true that there are certain ones that he, uh, that he uh, loved especially, and he made a special payment for them, but that doesn't denigrate or deny the fact that he uh, also had a love for the rest of mankind in spite of their rebellion against him. And so we. Well, I mean, I'm asking about him loving Satan, not oh, mankind. Does God love? No, God does not love Satan. Uh, but no. if God said, if God said, love your enemy, and if he smacks you on the right. Well, your left. Yeah, I'm, we, I'm just curious we, to know: Is God is such a loving creator? Well, now he created Satan, then didn't he? The, because he created everything, and Satan's under everything. Isn't that correct? He did not create Satan. He created a good angel who rebelled against him and became Satan. We have to keep that straight. He did not create Satan, but the fact is that when he says. He loves, uh, he loves uh, the, the just and the unjust. We have to remember that everything in the Bible is conditioned by the rest of the Bible. And God nowhere teaches that he loves Satan or the evil spirits. Uh, nowhere does he do that. He utilizes them. He employs them in his service, but he doesn't love them. Uh, but on the other hand, mankind who were created in God's image and who rebelled, he loves them. He still uh, does uh, wonderful things for them, even though they have rebelled against God. So we have well, why to... would God tolerate Satan in the first place? Why would he such a powerful... God's creator of everything. Why would he have to even deal with this guy be, be, or whoever uh, Satan is? I mean, be, why wouldn't he just say, you know what, stamp him out? What do I need him for? Because... Why, God, look at look at the enormous task Christ had in ruling over this world that was under the power of Satan and mankind had rebelled against God, so they were prone to uh, to all kinds of pride and rebellion against God, and yet in that setting. God rules over them and, and shows his love for mankind uh, and because that demonstrates uh, uh, wonderful attributes of God. It uh, uh, demonstrates the glory of God. And we can't question uh, uh, how, uh, just how far God should have gone or whatever. God is perfect in what he does. We're just thankful that God has given us the Bible so that we can learn so much about God, but and we don't have all the answers either. We there are times when we say, uh, 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 for example, I can I can tell you uh, something I don't understand at all. Why in the world did He save me? Why am I entitled to sa salvation? There are a lot of other people that are I would think would be more more uh, entitled than I would be. Uh, by nature, but God saved me. I don't know why, but it's in His mercy. It's in His love. And certain things we just have to leave it alone. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Yes. 
Can you read Isaiah 56, verse 6? Isaiah 56, verse 6. There we read, Also the sons... Uh, also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to Jehovah to serve him in the love name of Jehovah to be his servants everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant even them will I bring in my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Now, what is your question? Just what is God telling us there for our day? What do those verses mean? What is God? Yeah, we're, you know, he says, um, like, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it, and oh. um, I will bring them to the holy mountain. You know, what oh, is, what does this mean to us? Oh, it is very, very pertinent, very important for us. God is talking about the seventh day Sabbath. And we read in Exodus that the seventh day Sabbath was a sign that points to the fact that God uh, uh, sanctifies us, makes us holy. And if we do any work of any kind, or in the Old Testament, if they, when they were to observe that seventh day, day Sabbath literally if they did any work of any kind even the slightest little bit of work they were to be put to death God gives an illustration of that in Numbers 15 now why? because it was a sign pointing to the fact that even as we're not to work at all, they were in the Old Testament, they were not to work at all on the seventh day Sabbath, uh, but we are not to work at all at trying to get ourselves sanctified. That is, say, all the work was done by Christ. And if we do, if we try to take any credit at all, well, you know, I, I accepted Christ, or I got baptized in water, or I, I did this, or I did that, and therefore uh, that contributed to my salvation even, in even the tiniest way, then it's like I have, have violated the seventh-day Sabbath, uh, which called for the fact that I'm not to do any work in getting myself sanctified. And uh, that's what this verse is talking about. Those, for those... Uh, he, he loves, that God loves everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it. That is, who has p trusted God altogether for his salvation and has not polluted it by trying to take a little bit of credit for himself. And, uh, and uh, as a consequence, now he takes hold of my covenant, and the covenant is the law of God. There is, once we become saved and all the work is done by Christ, then we have an intense desire to do the law of God, keep the covenant. What about as a day of uh, worship as opposed to Sunday? Well, uh, if, if you see the, se the, the ceremonial laws and the seventh day commandment was a ceremonial law, just like uh, uh, we're not to offer a burnt offering or a blood sacrifice. And if we are going to still try to keep any of the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament, then we're denying that Christ has come to fulfill all of those. If, we're, if we were going to insist, well, you know, the Bible commanded in the Old Testament that you are uh, uh, spiritually, if you're a male, you have to become circumcised. Or, uh, as a family, you still have to observe the Passover. Well, then, we are, uh, we're no longer looking at those as signs. We're looking at those as, as something of the moral law that we still have to keep. And we've, we've modified the purpose of why these are. Those ceremonial laws were pointing to activity of Christ. 
Now, in the New Testament, God did give us two ceremonial laws, the water baptism and the Lord's table, and we're commanded to keep those until the end of the church age. And now, of course, we don't keep them anymore because they were signs that were pointing to the fact that uh, we have to have our sins washed away and so on. The uh, Sabbath, uh, the keeping the Sabbath holy is not a ceremonial law. It was a part of the Ten Commandments written. Uh, written it, uh, it's, it is part of the ceremonial law. And it is, you see, uh, it, it's very interesting how God did that. He gave Ten Commandments, nine of them are very moral in nature. Love God, uh, uh, you could sum it up, love God above all and your neighbor as yourself. And, it, and then in the middle of it, in the fourth commandment, he said, keep the seventh day Sabbath holy. And, and in other words, uh, when we see the spiritual meaning of that, it meant, now look, don't try to keep these nine commandments and get to heaven on the basis of the work that you do. Uh, remember, you need salvation, and all the work of saving is done by God altogether. And so it was a... It has never been understood that way by the churches, incidentally. They really didn't understand that the fourth commandment was a ceremonial law, but it is, it absolutely is, uh, because in... Exodus 31, God says the seventh commandment is a, a law that is fo focused on the fact that I sanctify thee. It is a sign pointing to a spiritual reality. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Good afternoon, Mr. Campaign. Yes. Yes, uh, could you read Deuteronomy 32, uh, verse uh, 39 and 40 for me, please? Deuteronomy 32. Yes. And let me turn to that a moment. And could you please turn your radio off, because that will help the call. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 39. We read... See now that I, even I, am he, and there's no God with me. I kill, I make alive, I wound, I heal, neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. Now what is your question? Well, that was for the first call of Mr. Campion, who was like questioning God and his ways, you know what I'm saying? So I'm just trying to let him know that God is God, and He does what He please, and there's none that can escape Him. No one can escape Him. He decides, and that's about it. Well, thank so, you for sharing these verses. They're very good, and you're correct. God is God. And we very humbly listen to what God teaches, and we never try to get wiser than He. We don't want to become a wise guy and say, Oh, no, God, that doesn't make sense. It would be better if, you, if it had been this way or that way. No way. That's just, uh, that's just pride. We very humbly say, Oh, Lord, I, I, I see what you have written here, and I believe it with all my heart, even though I may not understand the wisdom of this uh, at this moment, but I know that you are perfectly wise and perfectly uh, uh, the, the ultimate authority in every action. And so thank you for sharing that, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Campion. Yeah. Um... Um, I'm a person that <coughs> I'm a person that I'm I'm um, I do really don't want to um, cry out to God for mercy, but I'm I'm hearing about the um, judgment coming up, and I'm just concerned. How does one change their mind and decide they're going to listen to the Bible and start crying out? Well, I start thinking very seriously right now. <coughs> about the fact that in just slightly more than a year, the Day of Judgment will be here. The Bible clearly teaches that that is going to happen. And if you 
are not, and if we aren't walking humbly before God and have truly become saved, it is, it is guaranteed we're going to be part of that day of judgment, and it's going to be horrible beyond measure, beyond anything that this earth has ever experienced. And just start thinking about that for a while, and uh, and and then ask yourself, well, now you know. Uh, uh, that's what happens when I'm proud. I, 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 I'm willing to take that risk that I'm going to go into that day of judgment and somehow uh, uh, endure that in one way or another. Well, that's, that's, that's a bargain that you're making with God. Wouldn't it be a lot better to look at that and say, Wow, I don't want that. Oh, God, have mercy, have mercy. And I, and, uh, I know I'm proud and... and 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 I don't by nature I don't want to cry out for mercy and yet I know I have to humble myself. The Bible teaches a broken and a contrite heart. I will not despise. The Bible teaches very clearly. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And so the first thing, oh Lord, oh Lord, I've got so much pride in my life. Have mercy, have mercy. Could it be that you will break my pride and 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 that I might really walk humbly before Thee, and then maybe, uh, 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 as I start pleading for salvation, is it might even be possible You might even save me. Uh, but it, I know it depends entirely on Your action. But I know that pride is absolutely not the way to go. Uh, that's not the way to even be thinking, and yet that is. My nature, I know, I'm just a nor normal human being. That is the nature of mankind. Pride, pride. We all think we know better than God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Kempe. Yeah. I was calling about the... 40 years after Israel became a nation and the uh, what is your question? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I uh, you, when you try again, uh, you turn your radio off for one thing. That may help a little bit, and then ask your question once again, please. All right. Sorry. Is that a little better? Well, let's try it. Um. So the 40 years after Israel became a nation. And in 1988, and then um, and then seven days later, um, is May 21st, 2011, right? That be, that's when the when the Great Tribulation officially began. Right. So the the seven days, um, I was thinking when when Israel entered uh, across Jordan into the Promised Land. Wasn't there seven days that they marched around Jericho? And would those seven days count for those seven days between uh, May 14th and May 21st? I don't think so. I don't offhand. I don't see any relationship. I I uh, I, I just yeah. It's true that that was seven days, but and there are a lot of a lot of uh, things in the Bible that encompass ten, seven days. But uh, I, uh, I uh, it, it, it does not appear to me that there is uh, a tie-in with that particular event. Because if you think about it, it, it took them 40 years to go through the desert, and whatever year they crossed over the Jordan, and then you add seven days, to some extent that would be the 40 years from 48 to 88, yeah, except May 14th to May 21st. Yeah, except that the, uh, first of all, it was not a literal seven days. It was 40 years until they came to, get, got ready to cross the Jordan River. It was three days later that they really crossed. And uh, wow. then they were circumcised and observed the Passover. And then after a few more days, then they, uh, then they marched around the, the, uh, the uh, city of Jericho, so it, the time doesn't fit accurately at all. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. 
Corinthians 1, 14 uh, to 22. Philippians chapter 1, let's look at that, 14, verse 14. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more... Well, not bold. that one, not that one. I'm sorry? Um, chapter 10, verses 14 no, Philippians. Uh, to 22. No, Corinthians. Corinthians 1. First Corinthians, right? First Corinthians, uh, chapter uh, chapter fourteen, uh, chapter ten, verses yeah. fourteen through um, twenty-two. We're speaking about the uh, Lord's Supper. Therefore, no. Therefore, my dearly beloved. We Wherefore, my dearly beloved, dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I say, speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. And, of course, that bread is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is your question about these verses? Well, um, I know that uh, when um, God says, uh, dearly beloved, is basically a warning, but I want to um, uh, elaborate about this chapter so that I could understand it better. Well, but the fact is we are one only if we are a child of God. Just because we partook of the Lord's table, that didn't make us one. That was just a sign that was pointing to the fact that if we are true believers, we are one. And and that's a whole lot different uh, uh, situation than just the fact that we partake took of the communion table. Because in many churches, uh, during the church age, there were only very few who were actually true believers, and most of the people were not, and yet they partook of the communion table. But uh, uh, what, is your qu uh, what is your question? Want to understand it. Uh, that's oh, hold on just a moment. I'll be right back with you. We're talking about the Lord's table that we were to observe as a ceremonial law throughout the duration of the church age, which now has ended, and we don't observe that anymore. But uh, the purpose of the Lord's table was as often as you partake of this, you re the, that is of this bread and wine or bread and grape juice or whatever liquid was in the cup, you remember the Lord's death until he comes. It was an outward sign that had no spiritual significance in itself. But it was pointing us to the fact that even as we get physical strength from bread, so we get spiritual strength, spiritual life from the broken body of the Lord Jesus, that he made payment for our sins and even as we uh, uh, and, and the same thing when we drink of, of wine or grape juice we we that imparts uh, uh, that imparts spiritual life or physical life to us uh, strengthens us physically so the Lord's when he shed his blood and gave his life so we get life from him spiritual life and we remember the Lord's death until he comes. It also focuses our attention on the completion of our salvation when there will be the, the wedding feast of the bride and the lamb, which again is a figure of speech to indicate that now we are one with Christ, uh, even as the husband and the wife are looked upon by God as one, the two have become one flesh. And so when we finally receive our glorified spiritual bodies, then the Bible speaks about sitting down with at the marriage feast of the bride and the lamb, which was anticipated by the Lord's table, uh, uh, as we remember, the Lord's death until he comes. In other words, that we're also remembering the fact, yes, God saved us, but God still has to finish saving us namely by giving us our new eternal resurrected body and that is really where the 
the Lord's Supper was being focused. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Uh, thank you for your audience. I uh, have maybe two or three questions, whatever you allow this evening. My first question would be on uh, Mark uh, chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. Let's mark, that's got the Gospel of Mark chapter 2, verse 23. And there we read... And it came to pass that he went through the cornfields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisee said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have ye never read what David did when he had need and was in hunger, he and they that were with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priest, and gave also to them which were with him. And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Now, what is your question? Yes, sir. On my first question, uh, we as Christ's ambassadors are in the field on the Sabbath or on Sunday and are sometimes a hungered and in need of physical nourishment. By this verse, God does allow us to seek nourishment at a public restaurant. For instance, when we're in uh, overseas missions, uh, is this allowed if there's a need? Well, and we are hungry, uh, uh, even though uh, uh, it's a Sunday. Well, the, here, the, first of all, is it's talking here about uh, uh, eating corn. We, of course, need nourishment, spiritual nourishment. The Sabbath yeah. is to, to be looked at totally spiritual. Now, in the New Testament, our God in Isaiah 58 describes describes uh, the uh, New Testament Sabbath. It is the the best passage that I'm aware of in the Bible that describes the New Testament Sabbath, the, the first day Sabbath. It is, and we read it in uh, Isaiah 58, and let me read that uh, in verse 13. If thou turn thy foot away from the Sabbath. Now, our feet and our hands are used to illustrate doing our will. We, uh, we, uh, with our feet, we go where we want to go. With our hands, we do what we want to do. So effectively, God is saying, if thou turn thy will from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of Jehovah, honorable, and shalt honor him, and not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the, in Jehovah. And so, of course, if we're out someplace and we we uh, we have to eat, and finally we go to a restaurant to eat uh, because we it, we just need some physical nourishment. There would be no objection to that. We're we're yeah. not doing it for our pleasure. We're not doing it because uh, we are. Uh, it's a lot different, for example, than than going uh, to a restaurant on Sunday uh, with uh, some friends in order to really have an enjoyable time together, and it's all for our pleasure, not for our need. Thank you for explaining that, Brother Camping, because the need, the need is the key word there. My second question, if you would allow me, would be on um, uh, Genesis chapter 45 and verse 1. Genesis 45, verse 1. There we read Genesis 45, verse 1. Then Joseph could not uh, 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 refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. me. The, the context here is that uh, Joseph has been been sold as a slave by his cruel brothers, and uh, at the age of 17, and now he is uh, 30, 
Oh, well, let me see. He became prime minister, or second only to Pharaoh, when he was 30 years old. And and uh, uh, I think now he's a few years uh, through. Uh, yeah, he's seven years older because the good years have passed, 37. And he may be a little a year or two older. And now he's in Egyptian garb altogether. And he is a grown man. And his brothers come uh, to uh, to obtain uh, food because they're they're uh, they're uh, they're going to starve where they are, and Joseph now is going to test them whether they have any love for their uh, uh, just how their love is at this point, and so he doesn't tell them at all who he is and treats them very roughly, as a matter of fact, and then finally the co- time comes when he tells them who he is. And that's, that's what we're reading here in, in uh, chapter 45. Joseph uh, has his uh, le- uh, ten brothers in front of him, and he, uh, he uh, is, uh, is uh, going to disclose himself to them, and so he tells all of his own servants to get out of the room. And then... Uh, Joseph made himself known to his brethren, and he wept aloud. And the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. Now, what is your question? Thank you, Brother Campion. Uh, I want to key in on the phrase, uh, and uh, it, it says, uh, and, and there stood no man with him. Uh, I wanted to key on that because uh, could this term, no man, refer to the heathen? Uh, since the brethren were still present with him, it says no man stood with him. Or, or is it referring to that God does the work of salvation because it says no man stood with him? I'm um, kind of confused on that. It, it's possible. Yeah, obviously, you're right, are, are correct in that there has to be a spiritual meaning here. And uh, uh, Joseph is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in many ways. He is, and uh, and he stands alone. The Lord Jesus stands alone. He alone is the Savior, and no one is with him. And uh, these brothers, they represent those who are under the hearing of the word, and and uh, whether they uh, and and so on. And so uh, there could be. There could be that kind of a spiritual focus, but I've never really worked on this verse from that standpoint, so I'm not qualified to really help you anymore. Thank you, Brother Campion. I have one more question, but I know there are others on that are trying to get in, so I'll, I'll say good night. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. I had a question for you. On uh, January the 5th, uh, you guys had a person call in. He said a couple of words on the radio. You're not supposed to say the FCC has rules against that. And then on January the 31st, you rebroadcast the whole program again with those two words on it. I mean, you, you don't. Do you know what a seven-second delay is? There could have been kids and girls listening. Uh, yeah. D- don't you? Don't you have? Uh, no, we don't have that seven-second delay. We do not have that, and well, it's very, excuse me, it's very, very rare that someone curses uh, uh, on the on this program. It's very uh, rare, and we, uh, <laughs> you compared with what they hear on anybody else's radio station, it's, it's really nothing, nothing, nothing at all, and we do not applaud it we do not uh, uh, we do not call attention to it that is we don't try to uh, say, uh, give that as a, um, a way of, of, of doing it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's a very 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 incidental matter and we know we uh, I'm sure we have other imperfections but and and we uh, we uh, we have a lot of things that we have to pay attention to, and we've used this uh, seven-second delay in the past, and I think it created way more problems than it solved. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, hello. Yes. Romans three twenty-one and 26. 
please explain that, and I'll take it over there, okay? Romans 3, 21 to 26. Let's look at that. Romans 3. Romans 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and unto upon, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, that is a covering, through faith uh, in His blood uh, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare at this time His righteousness that He might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Now, the fact is, it, 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 God is emphasizing here in verse 22 that our right, we become righteous by the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the evidence of the fact that he, uh, that we are, that we have become righteous, that is, we've become saved, is the fact that now we believe in him. We have a, a, a profound trust in him and a desire to do his will. And, uh, and that's why it says he's the justifier of him which believeth in Christ. That is, though once we become saved, because Christ does all the saving, we're saved by his faith, uh, and then we are, uh, we, uh, we find that he, uh, we have trusted, we now trust in him altogether as the one who has saved us. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. The no camping? Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, Revelation 3, uh, 15. Uh, Revelation chapter 3. 15 through 18. All right, let's look at that. Revelation 3. God is talking about a church here, uh, and it is the uh, 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 church of the Laodiceans. Yes. Uh, and he says, uh, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee or vomit thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyesap, that thou mayest see. Now, what is your question? I've got about four questions that I want to ask you. And my first question is, uh, the Church of Laodicea, of Laodicea has a false doctrine, right? A false gospel? Well, it, no, this is a church. It's not a... Uh, it is a church that is... Uh, still recognized as a congregation of Christ, but it is having great troubles. It's right on the edge of losing its relationship with Christ. Uh, thou art neither cold nor hot. Now, the word hot has to do with uh, enthusiasm, enthusiasm, that is, of being zealous for Christ. A uh, cold has to do with uh, the, uh, the, uh, the cool waters of the gospel. And uh, they are just kind of neutral, they, uh, which is typical of uh, uh, churches of our day, very, very typical. They, they, uh, they uh, 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 although it's not here as bad as it is in the churches of our day where they also have a lot of, of uh, doctrines that are uh, altogether contrary to the will of God and, and 
and but this is indicating that this church is very close to being cast away that it is not uh, uh, that it no longer is rep- truly or accurately uh, 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 representing the kingdom of God the way that it should and uh, so uh, when it says I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire well that's right. the uh, that's the true gospel right. uh, and that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that's the raiment of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ right. that's what you need so in, in other words they don't have the true, true gospel then so they they don't they're long well they're a long ways away from the true gospel they're almost they're still called uh, God still uh, speaks of them uh, as uh, 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 it's one of his churches but they're almost ready to be cast away now on the other hand the church at Sardis that's also spoken of in in uh, Jeremiah three God says you're a dead church. Uh, uh, but there are still a few true believers within you. And so God is giving us a way, you know, showing us how he looks at any church at any time in history. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Mr. Camping. My question is, uh, Satan has uh, legions or, or many followers. Are they faithful to him? I mean, obviously they weren't faithful to God, but are they faithful to Satan? Well, the Bible doesn't discuss that, but they are. The evil spirits are thinking just like Satan does. God doesn't tell us that their thinking is any different. The Satan is a fallen angel who is in rebellion against God, and and he's got legions of fa- other fallen angels that are that are doing his will. So I suppose I suppose we could logically I'm saying logically not because we read this in the Bible, but we could say logically yes they they are also faithful to Satan. My my other question is. I mean, Satan being an angel, he's, uh, he was made above, sli- uh, slightly above man. I mean, he has intelligence, and it just seems that he goes about unknowing that God is going to be victorious. I just find that very odd that he doesn't seem to know that in the end he's going to be destroyed, but yet he yeah. has to know that. He does know that. He does know that. We read in a place in the Bible where the evil spirit said, Have you come to destroy us before our time? But he is the father of lies, the Bible tells us. Uh, he's a master deceiver, in other words. And it looks like he even deceives himself. He thinks somehow, somehow, I'm still going to win, even though deep in his thinking he knows he's going to be destroyed, yet somehow he's going to win. And think about it. Uh, for all through the church age, he was demoted. He had, uh, for the first 11,000 years of history, he was given the right to rule over mankind and come into heaven and accuse God and accuse uh, of of kowtowing to the uh, giving particular blessings to mankind and that's why they serve him and so on and then at the time of the cross he was thrown out of heaven and all the evil spirits with him and then for the next 1955 years he had no official standing he was he was under the wrath of god and uh, and yet he god allowed him to plague the churches uh, by sowing tares there, uh, putting people in the churches who were under his authority because they were unsaved, and uh, and uh, and uh, there, thereby he uh, there was great havoc done to the churches throughout the church age. But then, lo and behold, in 1988, which was the first year of the final great tribulation, that final testing time of 23 years, God employed Satan to rule in the churches, to be the ruler. 
uh, so that everybody left there that would not obey God's command to get out were actually worshiping him as their king, even though they thought they were worshiping Satan. He has he deceived them into thinking that they were still worshiping Christ. Christ, he came as an angel of light, as we read in Second Corinthians 11. But in fact, they were worshiping him. So, and we're still we've got a little bit more than a year left of that 23-year period. So, at it at during this period, Satan really looks like and he, uh, uh, he is the winner. After all, he rules over every one of the churches that are all over the world. Could anything be more magnificent than that? His desire to be like God was as close as anything could ever be. He was the ruler instead of Christ. Uh, Christ had abandoned the churches so that there was no more salvation possible. But the Bible assures us that on May 21, 2011, next year, when when uh, uh, all the true believers have been raptured, Satan and all the evil spirits, together with the unsaved of the world, will be entering into the day of judgment. And the Bible assures us that when that 153-day period comes to an end on October 21, 2011, that Satan and all the evil spirits will be annihilated. They will cease to exist, just as this whole world will cease to exist. The whole business will be gone forever. So he's not going to win in the long run, but at this time in history, I'm sure he feels very, very uh, self-sufficient. Thank you. God bless you, Mr. Paul. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, good evening. I was calling with a question about um, the Scripture verse in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Philippians, my... Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. There we read... My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. Yeah, but my God shall apply, supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, what is your question about that? Okay, now I understand my God shall supply all of my needs. But the second part of that verse, according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. If you could please elaborate on the second part of that verse. Well, yes. In other words, what is the real need of mankind? It is to get right with God. And only if we become saved, and that is altogether to the glory of God, will all of our needs be satisfied, because now then we are eternally secure in Christ, and we're headed for the new heaven and the new earth and all the glorious wonders of the of eternity future and so on. But uh, and he's not talking about the physical. Well, the, we we may think we have certain needs for physical things, but in God's sight, He uh, may have a different plan for us than when we know and and. But if we're a child of God, we know that we're safe in Christ's arms, whatever. We may be dying of starvation uh, or, or whatever, but we know that we still have the security of, of being in, that Christ will never leave us nor forsake us. And death is simply that grand moment when we leave our body and go to live and reign with Christ in, in heaven. And so uh, we can't lose. But now it's not talking here uh, about the the unsaved of the world. They have a need, but uh, they're not going to, uh, if they're not elected of God, if God has never made payment for their sins, he will supply uh, uh, their needs in this world to a high degree. But uh, but it's uh, this is really talking about those who have become, who are, elect of God, who are children of God. But thank you. 
for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Good evening. Very well. Hi. Yes, good evening. I've been uh, listening to you for a little while, and I had a couple of questions. Uh, I am a Christian. I've been raised a Christian for 50 years now, and there's just a couple of things that don't seem to go with the teachings that I've uh, been raised as a Christian. Uh, I've heard you say that uh, during these times of uh, tribulation that are coming up, uh, in between that time we can plead to God and ask and beg for mercy. And peace. Oh, hold on for just a moment. We're going to pause, and then I'll get back with you. We have a caller on the line, and and uh, uh, the question our caller was asking. He's been a Christian for a long, long time, and uh, uh, and I think he's uh, well. Well, do you want to ask your question? Maybe I'm putting words into your mouth. Uh, Mr. Camping, I had a couple of questions asked. And my first one was that uh, I've heard you uh, teaching that uh, th- uh, when the tri- uh, tribulation comes next year that uh, between now and then we can uh, beg God and plead God for forgiveness and hopefully he'll show mercy upon us. When in fact, doesn't in the moments the Bible teach us that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? Well, that uh, the fact is the Bi- that's, that's what the church is, that's what we have learned from the church is we've, been, we've also learned that if we believe on him we will be saved. We also have learned in some churches that if we get baptized in water, that that will also assist in our salvation. We've learned a lot of things. But now, in this day, when God has opened up a lot of information that had not been opened up before, in the book of Daniel, God uh, God uh, taught, gave a lot of information to Daniel, and then he said, a seal, uh, write it in a book and then seal it up. It's for the time of the end. And we're living in that time of the end. And we read in Revelation 5 where uh, there was a book that uh, was sealed with seven seals. And Christ began to open up that book so that by the time we get to Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, the seventh seal was off. And uh, that only happened during the last uh, uh, several few years, the last 20 years or so, that that book has been open. And uh, and lo and behold, we've learned uh, all kinds of things that we never knew before. One of the things that we learn uh, is that uh, that believing, for example, is a work that we do, and we cannot be saved by work. The Bible says in in First Thessalonians chapter one, that faith is work, and believing is a is the verb form of the noun faith. Uh, and faith and and the Bible absolutely tells us you cannot be saved by your works. Uh, it all has to be by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, and uh, uh, also we learn uh, uh, that we can't be saved by anything that we do. We we uh, learn from. Uh, Numbers chapter 15. We learned about uh, we learned about the seventh day Sabbath that they were not to do any work there because it was a sign pointing to the fact that that uh, Jesus did all the work to save us. And if we put any trust of any kind in anything that we do, then we are like the man who picked up a few sticks. Uh, in uh, Numbers 15, and God t- instructed Moses to have him stoned to death, uh, which is a picture of the fact you're still under the wrath of God, and so on. And th- so there's been all kinds of things that we have learned, because, and it, they all come out of the Bible. Now, actually, this has been a, mag- been a huge testing program for the churches. Uh, in fact, the, the Bible speaks of the period of great tribulation, which we now know to be a period of 23 years exactly, as a time of testing. And, uh, and uh, uh, as we learn this, are we listening to the Bible and are ready to change our, our thinking according to the Bible? Or is our trust in our church, which we have been in so many years, and we have, uh, we're learning that a lot of the doctrines of the churches are not biblical. Are we ready to make a change? And that is where we are today. 
And, and so that is the that is the, why what we're teaching on family radio sounds so different from what we have learned in the churches. I I I came I was right in the heartbeat of the churches for 70 years, uh, and uh, and uh, I I taught on the open forum for the past 50 years, and so. I, I taught many things incorrectly because of, uh, I taught in accordance with what I had learned in the churches. But as I have learned from the Bible, I've had to make correction. And uh, and uh, and the, the, the people in the churches are are uh, outraged because they hear family radio and open forum teaching things that they have never never learned, and they fail to realize that's because. They're not. Uh, they're not listening to the Bible. They're listening only to their churches, and and that is a death trap. That is absolutely a death trap. We have to put our trust only in the Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Well, brother camping. Yes. I I I heard something tonight on the radio that. I just need some clarification on. Somebody called and said if they were on a track mission and they were hungry and it was Sunday that uh, it would be okay to go to a restaurant to eat. But I'm wondering, does that line up with Deuteronomy 5.14? Deuteronomy 5.14? Yes. Oh, thou shalt keep the Sabbath day holy? Yes. Yeah. Uh, about about uh, the uh, man-servant uh, and the maid servant. It's a different Sabbath. The diff- the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, we do is not a ceremonial law that we observe any longer. The seventh day Sabbath, we observe the spiritual meaning of it, namely that even as in the Old Testament they were not to do any work of any kind on the seventh day Sabbath, so we are not to do any work of salvation but uh, the sabbath that we observe today uh, that we uh, are commanded is the first day sabbath remember when jesus rose from the grave it speaks in in uh, in uh, matthew chapter 28 as at the end of the sabbath that early sunday morning it was the end of the sabbath because the last Seventh day Sabbath had been observed by Christ Himself when He was lying in a tomb, and His body did not decay, decay at all. His there was no work being done of any kind, and as it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbath, same word Sabbath, and a, a new era of Sabbath began, which is the first day Sabbath that has uh, no relationship. Uh, with the seventh day Sabbath, it is simply a Sabbath that God has given us for our for our spiritual benefit that we are not to do our will on that day, but focus altogether on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you have to remember that uh, at any time in history, great percentages of the world are, have to work. Uh, day uh, from sun up until sundown, trying to get earn enough to have some uh, meat on the table, some food on the table. But God is simply saying, "Now look, uh, you, uh, you work six days, but when Sunday rolls around, that's a day that you have no obligation to work at all. You that's a day to to uh, think spiritually." to get in the Bible and do prayer and Bible study and sharing the gospel with others and so on. And uh, so we don't do... We, it's not to s- satisfy what we want physically. It is in order to help us spiritually. And so, yeah, then when we... If we are, are hungry and we don't have any uh, food and, and the only way to get some food is to go to a restaurant... Well, then we do that because we're not doing it for our pleasure. We're not doing it because we want a a very nice time. We're just doing it because we have a physical need. But uh, uh, it it becomes a a very incidental matter on that Sunday. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. 
How you doing, brother Captain? Very well, thank you. Yeah, you know, I believe I believe in, in May twenty first, two thousand eleven. I believe in everything that you've been talking about because I'm like a long time listener. And uh, you know, you, you get in a lot of emotional dealing with your family about it, and, 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 and people that you work with, and and you know, and it, it gets you, it just gets you all like emotional. Do you supposed to? Are you supposed to like listen to your emotions or, or, or what? Just or just put them aside or what? Well, I, I I didn't quite understand your question, but uh, the fact is that uh, this is, of course, going to become more and more pressing, more and more frightening. Uh, really, it's go uh, the Bible indicates that that it's going to become very, very frightening to more and more people, and uh, and uh, this gives an opportunity for those who have the truth to encourage people to uh, plead for mercy, plead for mercy. Uh, remind them of what the Ninevites did in the book of Jonah. They, they were pleading that maybe God would change his mind. And individually, this can happen, that today I'm not a believer, but as I am getting more and more frightened, I can cry, Oh God, is it possible? Is it possible? I know I deserve the day of judgment. I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that I don't deserve anything better than the day of judgment. But is it possible that I too might become saved? Is it possible that my children, my family, uh, that some of them might become saved before it's too late? Because I do know from the Bible that God is saving people today. I do know that He is a very merciful God. And it may be and and so there is that possibility that some of my family too might become saved and that can be a big focus of our life as we approach the end but okay uh one more question uh the question question is is they at the, at your family should not trying to hear you and they're not trying to understand and you you in the, you in there with them and you stay there with them, I mean... Well, you can't do... You Remember, we can't convince anybody of the truth, spiritual truth. That's God's task to do. And we do our best to share, and if they don't want to listen, then we can't share. And uh, But we can pray. They can't stop us from praying for them. And so we continue to do that, even though they don't want to listen. But finally, finally... Every day, it's getting one day closer, and it's coming very rapidly now. Finally, we'll come to that day, and and uh, we know that there, we'll have loved ones, we'll have friends that we love dearly who are going to be left behind, and we just have to leave them to God uh, and, and uh, hope that we ourselves are a child of God so that we will be caught up to be with the Lord Jesus. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Campin. Yes. Uh, how are you today? Very well, thank you. Okay, I'm um, a long-time listener. It's the first time I'm calling. Um, I have a question about the parable of the sower. Uh, in the parable, the seed that fell on the good soil, it said that some had multiplied... 30-fold, some 60-fold, and some 100-fold. And I was just wondering, uh, what's the spiritual significance of that? Why did they say that some multiplied uh, those different numbers? Because the spiritual significance is that we are not saved simply to now live selfishly for ourselves. We are immediately uh, 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 identified as a um, as an ambassador of Christ, a representative of the kingdom of God. If we're a true child of God, and we have to have a deep concern for the salvation of others, and so we use our our talents, our time, or our our money, or any way that we can, as efficiently as we can, to share the gospel with others. 
And the results of that will be that as others hear the gospel, some of them will become saved. Some will uh, uh, will be able to, to uh, reach more people than someone else. Or it's, uh, so th- there will be different numbers of people who finally do become saved as we share the gospel with them. In fact, we won't even know how many. We have no idea because we don't, can't see the hearts of anybody. But we know that God's word does not return void. It accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent. And it is the savor, the flavor, or the fragrance of life unto life. Those are the ones who will become saved and of death unto death. There will be those who will not become saved. They will not, they will not be interested, that interested in the word of God because God is not drawing them. And, uh, but that's God's business. So there will be some, there, if we have a, have a, a big audience, and we're faithful to the Word of God, then it means more are being saved. If we have a very small audience, well, then fewer. But the fact is, that is the nature of a true child of God, that he has a desire that others might be, become a child of God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Um, hello? Yes. Oh, I'm on already? Okay. Um, the verses I wanted you to look at are Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Yes. Um, probably 40 to 42. All right, now let's look at that. Matthew 13, 40 to 42. There we read. And... Uh, Uh, Let's start with verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Uh, And uh, And, uh, um, you can do um, 49 and 52. It's about the same time. 49 to 52. Uh, yes, so shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and, and sever, uh, that is, separate the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, what okay. is your question? Okay, is this, is this uh, spiritual? I mean, is it, because don't you teach that, you know, once you die, it's over? Or, or is he speaking of something else? Well, yes. Once you die, you are dead. And they, people who are dead uh, uh, before May 21, 2011, will not come into the day of judgment. Their bodies will be thrown out of the grave or their bones or their dust, whatever is left, as a further shame. But they themselves will not have any conscious existence. On the other hand, there's almost 7 billion people who will be alive at that time and who will enter into that furnace of fire, which is a figure of speech speaking about the day of judgment because God is a consuming fire. And they are the ones that uh, God is uh, speaking about. They will be wailing and gnashing their teeth. That is, uh, their gnashing of teeth means they're going to be yelling and screaming at God. They're, uh, and uh, they're weeping, and they're not going to repent. They're convinced that what they were doing was the right thing. Uh, the Bible indicates they're not going to uh, repent at all. They're going to, until they die, and... Uh, uh, they'll die the first day or the second or the third. Maybe some of them will live all the way till the end of 153 days and then. But finally, everybody will be dead and annihilated forever. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, uh, Brother Camping. I wanted to share something I was thinking about as a modern illustration of just how close we are. It's as if we've been on a 10,000-mile journey, and 
here we are on the freeway, and we only have one mile left to go. And, you know, think about being on the freeway and that next exit coming up, how close we are. Well, yeah, you can use a lot of figures like that, but I'll tell you, when we see how fast a month goes by, and and we know that it will be early next year. That that's pretty heavy because any time we have any plans to wait till next year to uh, start going to school or or to start building my house or to take that vacation or uh, to uh, uh, whatever we are planning. Uh, a year goes by very rapidly, and I'll tell you, this year is going to go by very rapidly, and suddenly it's going. We're going to be there, and it's just awesome what we're facing. We we we've, we've never. The world has never, never, never faced anything like this, and it's it hasn't registered altogether, of course, yet. But as every day goes by and it's talked about more and more, there's going to be more and more fear, and uh, and uh, it's uh, it's 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 going to take its toll on uh, on uh, mankind as they face this, and and uh, a great number of people are going to tr- mock it. Uh, in order to uh, assist them in, in being able to face it. Others will go into complete denial. I don't want to think about it at all in order to help face it. And others will just be frightened in their soul and frightened in their soul. And and uh, and, uh, f- and there will be some who will be crying to God for mercy. And, oh, that is wonderful that there is hope. For those who are really broken before God, maybe they still can become saved. Because right up until the day of judgment, the Bible assures us that God is saving people. And that is a tremendous encouragement to the human race if we'll only listen to God about it. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, uh, Mr. Camping. I have uh, a few Bible verses that I would hope you could uh, help me understand a little better. Uh, in the four in the four Gospels, uh, we have a different explanation of what uh, took place at the tomb. Uh, in Mark. Uh, we read that there was one angel in Matthew. Uh, there was one angel, and then we go to um, Luke, and we find two men at the tomb. And in John, uh, we have uh, an explanation where Peter and the disciples ran to the tomb, and uh, Mary was with them, and then uh, they found the tomb empty. Well, yes, I understand your question. Yes. Now, uh, could you elaborate on that? Well, yes. You First of all, God could have written the Bible so that any six-year-old can understand everything in the Bible. Because God is God. He's infinite in, in his ability to do what he wants to do. But God purposefully wrote the Bible so it appears to have contradictions. It appears to be very, uh, and it is indeed very difficult at times to understand. we got to compare Scripture with Scripture. And all of this is done so that only those who are really broken before God and who are really uh, trusting in God will realize Look, I don't understand this, but I know it's true because God has written it. And uh, maybe some of this God will teach me, and maybe some of it he won't. Now, however, this, this, the kind of thing you're talking about is very easy to explain. Let's suppose that you saw an accident happen. And, uh, and uh, uh, two cars struck each other, and then they... One of the cars burst into flame, and then uh, uh, next thing the uh, uh, the uh, 
medical uh, people came uh, with their with their wagon, uh, and then the fire engine came, and then this happened, and then an insurance adjuster came there because he right away wants to uh, have a good record of uh, of how much damage was done, and now you have to write a report. And you're only allowed to write three sentences about what you saw. If you are a fireman, you're going to write about the fire engine coming. If you're a physician, you're going to uh, talk specially about the, about the extent of the injuries. If you are an insurance adjuster, you're going to talk about something else. If you're a mechanic or a, uh, you work on, the, on uh, the cars to uh, repair them, you uh, you are going to talk about something else because you only have three or four sentences to to talk about, and so now you, you list you take all those records and let, put them down and you look at that and you say wait a minute that all uh, there that's talking about several different different accidents they all sound different. And that's exactly the way it is. People were coming and going, and at one instance there's one angel, at another instance there's two, at another instance something else happens, and and God picks up honestly and truly and faithfully what happened at that moment, but he does not lay it all out in an orderly fashion. Uh, and so what we do is we look at each and every statement, and then between all of them we can get a larger picture of exactly uh, the important things that did happen and there's no there's no problem with that at all uh, Mr. Camping I thank you uh, very much it was a, a very thank you excellent, for excellent ex explanation thank you thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum Joshua chapter 3 verse Three and four. Joshua chapter three, verse three and four. There we read chapter three, and let's uh, let's let's start with verse one to pick up the context. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed to from Shittim and came to Jordan. He and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host and they commanded the people saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of Jehovah your God and the priests of the Levites bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it about two thousand cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye uh, must go, for ye have not passed this way before. And I'm sorry, we can't finish talking about this, because we've come to the end of our time. But call again another time, and we'll look at that. Until now, as, but now I have to say good night, and, uh, and may the Lord richly bless you. Every weekday.